Good evening, everyone. I'm going to call the Board of Appeals meeting to order at 5.30 p.m. Uh, members present, we have Wendy Smith, who is the chair, um, Cole Henrich, and also Henrich. Heinrich. Oh, sorry. And Stephen Isaacson. Also present, we have Inspector Burris and Attorney Meyer. Um, the meeting has been properly noticed and posted according to law. Uh, good evening. Uh, we have a couple of items on our agenda packet for this evening. We'll begin before we um, take on two matters for consideration. We'll start with consideration of meeting minutes dated April 9th, 2024. Those appear in the packet. Uh, do board members have any suggested revisions or comments to those minutes as drafted? Okay, hearing none, um, and just as an FYI, Stephen, even if you are not at that meeting, you may vote to approve those minutes or um, consent to approve those minutes. Uh, so hearing no objections to the draft minutes, those minutes are approved. All right, um, we have item number six and item number seven, both of which have differing standards of review. So I'd like to ask the village attorney to start with the standard of review for um, perhaps item six, and then we can come back to you for item seven later. Uh, okay. Great. Okay, so item number six is request to appeal the village's interpretation of village code 225-6 and village code 415-18 at residential property 3536 North Kramer Street. And we'll start this out with the village attorney providing the legal standard. And then we'll proceed into a hearing portion of deliberation where we get to get testimony from the village and the applicant uh, before we deliberate. So the village attorney, can you provide us with the legal standard applicable to this particular request? Sure. And I just want to confirm before I start that this is going to be an appeal to interpretation to allow. I think that special exception. Yes. And um, perhaps someone from the applicant can confirm that even though special exception was checked, um, I believe there are some email documentation in the packet indicating that actually we should treat this as an appeal for interpretation to allow. Is that correct? Okay. Perfect. There. So in, in that case, the standard that we have to look at is whether or not there is substantial evidence to support the inspector's conclusion. This isn't what we call a de novo review where we would look at everything brand new, but whether or not Wisconsin courts have defined it as um, whether reasonable minds could arrive at the same conclusion as the inspector. So that's the standard that we're looking at. And specifically um, for this Milwaukee downspout disconnection program, can you just direct us to the factors that are going to be important for us to look at to see whether the decision is supported or not? Certainly. There is a list of five factors. Those are found in two different sections of the code, uh, section 225-6C3 and sections 41518B sub 3. Um, those factors are whether, so I'll, I'll just read the statute. Yeah, you have to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> in the combined sewer service area, discharge of water to the combined sewer system from roof leaders, conductors, or downspouts of residential structures, which contain up to four dwelling units, is prohibited if the following conditions are present. And there's five different conditions. One, the roof drain is external. Two, sufficient space is available to locate the discharge point at least five feet away from the basement or foundation walls and property lines. Three, previous surface is available at the discharge point. Four, the discharge location is level or slopes away from the structure, but not so steep that the discharge would cause erosion. And five, the discharge water will not create ice on pedestrian walkways or otherwise create a nuisance for adjoining property. Okay, great. Um, and if you wanted to refer back to that, I believe those appear on page 23 of the agenda packet, those yeah. five criteria. Okay, um, any questions for the village attorney at this time, knowing that if you have questions later, we can always ask her any questions at this moment? Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. All right, um, we'll start out consideration of this matter with a statement from the village and then we'll proceed with a statement from the applicant. Um, do we have a representative of the village that would like to provide a statement? 
Can you swear in? Inspect the barracks. Do you mm -hmm. solemnly affirm that the testimony about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God? I do. Um, so we'll start here that um, the director of the DPW provided a uh, memo as well, and I'll read um, just a portion for that so that we have some background. Um, on February 1st, 2001, the village of Shorewood adopted the combined sewer service area downspout disconnection program. Uh, the program addresses approximately 1,946 residential properties within the combined uh, storm sewer area, which is located primarily east of Oakland Avenue and provides the framework for the village to comply with MMSD requirements to disconnect uh, the residential downspouts where it is most applicable. Uh, on March 6th, 2024, the village issued a downspout disconnection notice detailing the MMSD requirements, along with a report from Strand Associates indicating which downspouts were required to be disconnected and which were permitted to remain. The notice provided until November 1st, 2024, complete the required work. The owners of this property emailed the Department of Public Works on April 1st, 2024, with a request grant an exemption to the notice. After discussing the conditions um, of this specific site with myself um, and visiting the site, the DPW director notified the property owners that, uh, that the program requirements had in fact been met. And with respect to the available area um, available to discharge the downspouts and that an administrative exemption could not be granted. On April 24th, 2024, the village received the Board of Appeals application from the property owner. Uh, in addition to the, the five points necessary to, to say that a, you know, a disconnection is warranted, um, uh, the next paragraph, uh, parent B, um, states this, which to me is important, and it states that um, if after disconnection and implementation of all practical on-site stormwater management techniques, um, roof drainage has caused property damage or unsafe conditions, then reconnection to the combined sewer is allowed. So it provides um, it provides redress for if there if there is an issue. Uh, and so what we have seen before is that um, to, to provide a, uh, an exception before anyone has tried anything um, seems a bit unnecessary. Um, within the packet, again, we have the, the memo that the DPW provided the initial notice and report that Fran sent out uh, property survey maps and pictures of the site. All right. And can you explain to us the downspouts at issue and confirm that there appears there are two? That is correct. Okay. Um, and it looks like both are not exempt. That is correct. So I'm looking at page 26 and we have a east side downspout and a west side downspout. Okay. And is your assessment here that the, um, some con concern about puddling or pooling of water at both of these downspout locations, can you provide any information for us from your perspective on whether that's a realistic probability in terms of sloping of the surface area or walkways? Sure. Um, so I have, uh, fielded, you know, many, um, calls about this specific thing again, you know, 1900 affected properties. Um, and I'll say generally the issue or the, um, the concern is that, um, you know, well, water's eventually going to flow onto the sidewalk and may create an icy condition. Um, I'll say that, uh, the idea here is that, you know, probably 90% of the time, 
Um, we're dealing with a, a period when it's raining. So everything is already wet, right? Um, so the idea of, you know, creating an icy condition is a very limited period of time that that would ever be a concern. And uh, um, when, you know, like we think, you know, um, what early spring or some in the winter and things, um, snow melt creates icy conditions on sidewalks and things. And that's something that has to be dealt with um, by all property owners. And so again, the um, that the DPW has gone through, grand uh, engineering went through and all determined that there's sufficient area and that it's not that the downspouts are, you know, discharging directly onto the sidewalk, um, but that there is sufficient area. And so again, the, the consensus from the village is that the requirements have been met and that there's area for this and that a nuisance would not be created. Now, again, if we were wrong in that assessment, um, the option there is to, you know, demonstrate, oh, nope, we do have an issue and let we can reconnect it. Okay. Questions for Inspector Burris? What are what are the other remedies possible? If, I mean, I think you alluded to there's some things that you could try. If you had to oh, disconnect, yeah. What what other things could sure, so the homeowner do? Um uh, so you can install a rain garden. Um it's not common, but there are uh, like, you know, kind of underground uh, retention systems um, that that could be installed. Rain garden is probably the most the most common, um, but I'll say in 85% of cases, it is just that the downspouts are discharged through the yard. Um, and while, again, uh, you look at it in a single property, um, may not be, you know, necessarily discharging that much with respect to the size of the roof and things. Uh, it's it's kind of the, um, you know, the premise of uh, it takes a village. Every little piece now put together is what creates the, the larger impact on the sewer system. But you're saying that uh, if this was disconnected, that the immediate the immediate fallout from this might be I see area that um, be possibly somewhat dangerous to somebody walking. Looking at this, it does not look like that's an impact. Is that your assessment? Right. The yeah the the position of the village is that uh, that it is anticipated that the discharge of the downspouts in the available location would not contribute significantly to an icy condition. Or a hazard to Correct. human act. Um, so for the specific downspouts, the eastern downspout is located um, right next to the front door. Is that correct? That would be the west. Oh, excuse me, the west. <laughs> Uh, the west side downspout is connected or near the front door. East side, it looks like it's in a um, yard area. Um, is it the village's interpretation here that discharge could be routed away from any walkways? Yes. For both of these downspouts? Yes. Okay. What What is the homeowner's objection? I'm just curious. Uh, we will hear from the oh, homeowner directly. Okay. <laughs> so once we're done with the village, we'll have that uh, have an opportunity to hear from them. Um, any other questions for Inspector Burris at this time? Okay, let's proceed to a representative from the homeowners that would like to make a statement. You can come up to the podium and please speak into the microphone. Um, I, I suppose uh, when you get sworn in and you have questions, we can direct those questions to the inspector to get answers for you. Would you like to approach? Hey, 
Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, we do need to swear you in first. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. Can you raise your right hand? Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I hope you got. I do. And if you want to speak right into the microphone. I do. I'm oh, sorry. And can you provide us with your name, please? Dale Fredrickson. Fredrickson. Thank you. Uh, would you like to provide us with some information about your property and the conditions uh, about these downspouts that leads you to believe that downspout disconnection is improper or specifically the, that the village's interpretation of those ordinance requirements doesn't apply to these particular downspouts? Yes. Can I, though, first just give a couple of general statements um, I go yes, go details. ahead. Okay, so our first appeal was the DPW. Uh, unfortunately, they did not conduct a satisfactory visual inspection, having looked at only one of our two downspouts. Uh, so they, uh, so the DPW missed the uh, the east downspout and our particular area of concern um, about the limited pervious surface at the uh, on the east side of our property, uh, east side of our house, due to elevation differences and. Uh, a GIS uh, map is not going to give you any idea what elevations are. So that's why it's unfortunate that the director uh, missed that. Secondly, uh, MMSD section 3 at 107 3A uh, allows disconnection, as Mr. Burris uh, read, um, unless it would cause property damage, which I read as uh, anything, including basement wall or unsafe conditions, getting to icy, icy sidewalk conditions. And uh, as such, all five of those conditions are required to disconnect a downspout. And we, we can attest that three of these conditions are not met in our case, three of the five. And I'll go into that in detail in a moment. And then thirdly, we, uh, I guess in kind of rebuttal to previous comment, we question the strategy of the village requiring disconnections across the board and later allowing reconnection after property damage has already occurred or unsafe conditions have occurred. Somebody gets hurt, slip on the ice. So those are kind of our general um, general ideas on how the village uh, did not interpret things correctly. Um, so as to the, as to the details, um, as I said, we believe that three of the five stipulations for downspout disconnections are not met in our case. Uh, that refers to subpoint C, D, and E in the village code section that was read earlier. Um, MMSD recognizes that while disconnection of downspouts is a good thing, there are requirements which must be met, including avoidance of property damage or unsafe conditions. Um, so subpoint C, is the first one I would I'll talk about. It's it states that pervious surface is available at the discharge point, um, which may be understood to, be, to uh, require that um, there's enough grassy surface after the dis, uh, discharge point um, uh, to take the flow without flowing onto public property sidewalk. In fact, that's what Milwaukee's. That's what Milwaukee. I don't see this exact wording in Sherwood, but Milwaukee uses that exact wording that. Um, disconnections must not result in flow of, of new water onto um, public walkway, which is obviously not going to be met in this case. We have a huge increase in volume of water. Talking about the west downspout now, there's going to be a huge increase in the volume of water coming off the roof, flowing down our hill and onto the sidewalk and rushing down Kramer Street. Is uh, that that's relates to the west downspout, um, and in fact, this pervious requirement for pervious surface is not met for either the west or the east downspout. The west downspout, because of the the, the velocity of the water, it's going to get on. It's going to get down that hill. There isn't a whole lot of there's not a whole lot of area between house well, uh, house. And, it's a very you know limited size property and so that water doesn't have doesn't have to go very far before it gets to our hill and then down increasing by I don't know threefold the amount of water the volume of water that's hitting the sidewalk compared to present conditions 
Um, secondly, uh, point D, um, well, let me just, as far as the east downspout, the previous surface is limited by the grade issues, which I'll get to in a moment. So I'm on to the second point that we feel is not met by our, dis by our disconnection, and that's uh, the discharge location is level or slopes away from the structure, but not so steep that the discharge would cause erosion. Um, our west downspout discharge point leads to a hill with more than a three foot elevation drop and a very short span of, of length. We can expect erosion to occur with the expected volume of water. Uh, our neighbor just to the north of us has a similar situation, has been disconnected in a similar manner that ours would be. And all you have to do is look at her hill. It's mostly dirt. Erosion has occurred in, in intensively. And um, that's what I think we would, you can all expect for our property. Um, so there's a large area at the discharge point where the, well, that's, let me go on. Going to our east downspout, the discharge point has a level grade for a short distance, but then slopes upward about a foot and a half going to the east between the house and the garage. There's this elevation change of a foot and a half. So the result is that the, the entire area adjacent to the basement wall is a low spot, does not drain well but stays wet for quite a while after rainfall. The additional water discharge, if disconnected, will make conditions even worse, which leads to our concern about basement wall getting damaged by, by the water. And we, we can show you a video from one of the recent rainfalls where there's just puddles all over that area just outside our, our basement walls on the east side of our, of our property. Puddles all, all going on. Whole, that whole area, and it doesn't drain. You know, you got clay issues. Um, so that's the second point. The third point, the requirement for disconnecting is that the discharge water will not create ice on pedestrian walkways or otherwise create a nuisance for adjoining property. The west downspout, if it's if disconnected, will create an icy sidewalk under conditions of rain by and followed by freezing overnight. We say this with confidence because we've lived there for over 40 years. So we've seen it happen over and over again under existing conditions without the extra extreme, uh, extra volume of water that will be added. So this, the increase in discharge will cause significant flow down the hill with velocity. And um, so again, this requirement to uh, avoid icy sidewalks and the, the ensuing public safety issues, not met. So those are, I think, my uh, my main points. Uh, if you'd like to be sworn in, yes. Please stand at the podium and speak into the microphone, please. Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. Please state your name. My real name? Please. Petronella Fredrickson. It's on, it says PD on there. Okay. It's easier. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, uh, I wanted, I had a question for Mr. Burris. I think you said Strand had looked at our property. Did you? Did you Correct. Remember? Yes. Okay. And Strand is the engineer? Yes. Okay. And that's a, a separate uh, entity from the village? Yes, it is. Okay. And he, he took pictures or she took pictures of front and back? Is that? Yes, Strand is the one that conducted the initial survey. And yes, took all of the pictures okay. um, for all the properties. Yes. Okay. Now, my recollection is that we had a, some young girl came to the yard and she wanted to look in front and in the back. I mean, she said she was from the village of Charwood. Okay. Yes. And so is, would, is that, was she a representative of this company? If... Uh, unlikely, I believe you may be speaking of Leanne, the director of the DBW. No, I don't think it was Leanne because she did not go to the Leanne did not go to the back. Leanne is the DPW director, and she did not go to the back. Okay, she just went to the front. I'm home. I'm home most of the day. That's why I'm sure. I'm just I don't know who that individual was. Okay, all right. Um, so perhaps can I pause and get clarification on? There was an initial inspection of both downspouts, and is it? 
accurate to say that they both downspouts downspouts were visually inspected at that time? Yes. And then upon reinspection, was the east side downspout visually inspected at that time? I cannot speak to that because the director of the DPW, Leanne, was the one that made that inspection. So I, uh, I believe I saw a reference to the materials that there was reliance on aerial photography for some of the downspouts. Sure. Yes. For which downspout was that? Both. In the email? Uh, in the, I believe it's in the packet, but perhaps I am mistaken. It, it is in the report. She did not go to. Yeah, I'll try to find the um, yeah. reference. This is on page 22 of the, looks like the um, reports and presentations to the Board of Appeals, page 22. Um, I field reviewed the downspout at the front of the home, but did not enter the fenced backyard to review the second downspout and instead used the village's GIS aerial photography capabilities. Do you know what that refers to, aerial photography? The GIS mapping system, yes. So is that like a just a visual imagery of? Yes. Okay. Yep. Overhead. So yes. like Google Earth type of? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so is it your testimony that you're, you do not allow someone to come into your backyard, so you're not aware that someone visually inspected that eastern downspout or the, or the surrounding property? To rephrase that um i i upon will... asking for an exemption yes do you recall a representative from the village entering into your backyard to inspect the eastern downspout no okay thank you um you can proceed with um your statement if you'd like okay um i there's just a couple other things i would like to point out is that um the property that our house is built on is called mineral spring heights and there is water underneath. We have, um, it's hard for us to grow vegetables because we have all those little bugs that eat vegetables because it's a very uh, uh, damp area underneath to start with. So um, I'm, I guess this is concerned for the west downspout. Um, we do have video that we'd like to show you because when it does rain, it does not soak in, especially in the back. And from the, that's the east. And the west, um, whenever it rains, uh, whatever time of the year it is, there's an area right in front of where our downspout would be disconnected to discharge that is the sidewalk is always wet. The North House sidewalk isn't wet. The South side isn't wet. So there is obviously rain coming from our hill already going down onto the sidewalk. And as my husband said, we have seen ice. We always have ice in front of our house due to that. Okay, and then I do have some videos. Would you? Can we take, Can you take video that? even if it wasn't noticed? Prior, that's fine to, okay. Um, if you have it readily available, I'm not yeah. sure if we can project it or anything, but oh, if I, you, yeah, if you have it oh. and you can show us, yes, you're, you are. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't see that. Um, I can gather I'm over here if you'd like to. Well, uh, how, how Would you like to approach and maybe. Yes. You want us to reposition? Like, I'll just sit. Yeah. Perfect.
Thank you. All right, do we have questions for our homeowners? I, I don't. No question for the homeowners. Would you mind providing a copy of that video, um, particularly the first one that you showed us with the puddling in the east side yard or at the east side yard? Um, can you email that to Toya so that we can have it as part of our record? Um, and if you don't have Toya's email address, we can provide it to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, now. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You may. Yes. As long as we have it on the record, that would be great. Okay. Um, perhaps before we go into deliberation, are there any final questions for Inspector Burris? Um, I had one question. Do, do you have a calculation of the distance between the uh, west downspout and the sidewalk in question? Um, so it, it must be at least five feet, but do you have kind of a sense of the distance between that downspout and the potential for icy walkway? I didn't, I didn't see kind of a, um, map of distances there. No. And, um, so they may be able to, uh, looking at the, uh, at the pictures provided, um, so from the front of the house to the sidewalk itself, um, is probably my 12 or 16 feet, maybe. Okay. All right. Uh, any final question? Hearing none. Um, I'll move to enter into deliberation amongst the board, which would close the testimony portion of this hearing. Uh, do I have a second? I have a second. Okay. Um, let's proceed into deliberation. Um, again, as the village attorney has explained, uh, what we're looking here for is substantial evidence that supports the village's determination here based off of those five criteria. Um, does anyone have any initial thoughts on whether the village has satisfied the burden of finding these five factors for um, the east and west downspouts? Whether the village has, has not satisfied. Well, we're, we're looking for substantial evidence to support right. their decision to order discon dis disconnection. disconnection. Right. right. So it's not a preponderance of the evidence or beyond a reasonable doubt or anything like that. It's whether or not reasonable, a reasonable mind could make the same conclusion. So it's a pretty low standard, but it's still a standard that needs to be met. I'm not sure that I understand the mm -hmm. question that I would have is homeowners put on an eloquent presentation. I think that's what I would like. So that, that's unfortunately not the standard of review that we're looking at. It's based on the evidence that was presented, including the homeowner's presentation, whether or not considering that evidence. Okay. So we, we would either say we agree or we don't agree. Correct. Okay. So perhaps we can take this um, downspout by downspout. So looking at um, 
do we have a preference on which one we want to start? Let's start with the front door. Sure. Uh, front door is west, right? Yep. If I understand the compass yes. correctly. Uh, west, um, near the front door where the testimony suggests that there may be um, danger of icy conditions or um, especially for the walkway in front. Um, our homeowners uh, object to the factors relating to pervious surface, although this does look like grass in front of the home. Um, the discharge location, um, it looks like a contest about the steepness of the hill that would cause erosion. And then the final factor about potential for ice in walkways. Uh, my concern is, um, well, um, I suppose I agree that a reasonable person could agree that the water that discharges from a disconnected downspout there could um, enter into a pervious surface and that the department's determination that the hillside is not so steep to cause erosion, although it's a little bit difficult for me to understand exactly how steep that hillside is, um, and it seems a little bit hypothetical as to the risk of ice on walkways. Um, so I'm not quite, I'm not quite sure, um, about that. Uh, did any of the testimony I, I, impact I, strongly? Yeah. I, I think what, what, what we're struggling with a little bit is just like, do and, and I know this doesn't maybe answer the question right away, but it's the only thing that I can think of is does does the engineer's report do we do the, do we think like this is going to cause more unnecessary water and actually cause the damage that they're talking about in their testing, right? Do, do we think the engineer's report is 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 sound or or we going to go with the the you know homeowners, you know, kind of experience with the, with the house and what they're what they're saying. I really think is the crux of this issue. And I know that's not maybe what we're arguing, right? <laughs> but we're just dealing with the evidence, but I you know, that's I mean, I feel like that's what we're I mean, looking at and I guess if we can talk about, you know, their presentation and talk about what the evidence was that was presented. Um I mean, I think that's the the crux of, of the of the issue is does would it would it add way more water or would it actually not matter if for the engineer's report i think they're they're saying you know strand is, is basically saying you know if these are disconnected it's not going to change anything um you know in terms of um reliability of the evidence um a contractor whose expertise is assessing whether thousands of downspouts meet the criteria right. holds weight for me in terms of their visual inspection of the west side downspout, the hill side, right. and the potential for, say, dangerous conditions on the walkway. Mm -hmm. um, although the homeowners have provided some kind of anecdotal testimony about the potential for icy walkways, um, I do think that um, the surveyors that initially came out and provided the report um, I mean, I don't find anything objectionable about their report. And mm -hmm. so it's difficult for me to second guess right. their expertise. Totally. Absolutely. And I, and I think basically what Inspector Burris said was, you know, we basically, we understand that walkways are getting wet and that they're going to ice essentially. Like that's, we are, we already know that that's, a, that's a fact that's, that's happening. Is it, is it a bigger risk to have a little bit more water or not, you know? And it does seem like, um, this strip of uh, property, um, you may have very similar situations in the neighboring properties. So mm -hmm. um, even though this is just one property before us, if we're granting exceptions to this downspout disconnection requirement for this property, um, uh, I worry about opening the door to lots of other homes requesting an exception on the same bases um, and potentially having a negative impact on the overall you know, sewer capacity. Yeah. And, and then I guess my next question is, is do we have to make a decision? Is it all or nothing? Or do we, can we actually deliberate between the two or one or the other? I believe we can determine downspout by downspout. Okay. And in fact, okay. um, I did break them apart because I, I think there is something different about the backyard right. downspout. 
I would okay. Imagine. Any other thoughts about the west side downspout? Yeah, I I think um, you know, I think the homeowner knows their property, living there for forty years, probably better than came out. They put on a very eloquent presentation. I'm a former owner. You know, the disconnect of a couple of downspouts financially is do it. But I think that they're talking about the kind of soil that they have. Water may pool on top and not go down. There are areas that it does go down and affects the basement integrity. You know, they went to a lot of work to, to make this presentation. And I am thinking that it requires more study based on they present and the engineer and the iteration of other people in there. This is an individual case. Folks have lived there for 40 years. They property, know their soil. And um, it's not a financial matter. But it was, that would be a story. But it's not. It's just something that they know. And they're appealing so that they don't end up with the water sitting on the surface and running down to the bottom. I think that should be based on that, there may be another way to look at this. Okay, um, for the Eastern downspout, um, the video evidence showing puddling and pooling just from rain makes me, um, uh, in, in combined with perhaps lack of adequate visual inspection of the area, especially relating to sloping and kind of, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm pooling uh, potential uh, makes this a little bit different for me in terms of whether the department's decision here is adequately supported. Um, I, how do we feel about possibly remanding on the village's determination on the eastern downspout um, because it appears that there hasn't been adequate visual inspection of that area? And again, the elevation and land changes in the backyard um, it's not something that you can easily see via Google Maps. Mm -hmm. um, I might be inclined to push that one back to the village for an additional inspection and perhaps reconsideration. Um, mm -hmm. But additional thoughts on that? I, I would agree with that. Yeah. I would agree with it. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, any further discussion on either the west or the east downspout? I, I do feel the west one should be should be disconnected. That. I don't, I don't, yeah, so. And I, I disagree with that. Okay. Um, let's proceed to a vote then. Um, we'll break this into two motions, um, one for downspout mm -hmm. west and one for downspout east. Um, and I'll propose a motion. Um, let's see, I want to get my wording right. Uh, I move to... Deny, or excuse me, I'm already screwing up on my lunch. I move to uphold the determination of the village in its interpretation of village code 225-6 and village code 415-18 at residential property 3536 North Kramer for the West Downspout. Was that right? That was to uphold. Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, I move. Is there a second? Second. And that's not a vote. It's just a second to get us to a vote. Um, okay. Uh, Toy, did you get that? Okay. Can you call a vote for that particular motion? Call Heinrich. Heinrich. Aye. Heinrich. That's okay. Did you say aye? Aye. Wendy Smith? Aye. And Stephen Isaacson? Nay. Motion carried 2 1. Uh, the second motion, um, does anyone else want to entertain a motion for the Eastern? Or I, I can propose a motion if you'd like. No, you can. Okay. Uh, I'll move uh, to remand the interpretation of Village Code 225-6 and Village Code 451, excuse me, 415-18 at Residential Property 3536 North Kramer Street as to the East Downspout at issue back to the village for reconsideration. 
I think I should add specific reconsideration factors or is it sufficient for me to just say reconsideration? I would be for reconsideration of the disconnection criteria specifically relating to the potential for pooling of water damage to the home or basement foundation and other factors relating to water discharge. Excellent. Do I have a second on that motion? Second. Sorry, can you call a vote, please? I can. Wendy Smith? I vote yes to remand. Stephen Isaacson? Yes. And Cole Heinrich? Yes. Motion carry 3-0. Uh, so in this case, uh, the first motion relating to the western downspout, we have uphold the determination of the village. However, for the eastern downspout, we've remanded it back to the village for them to take another view of that, especially since we have some concerns about the water pooling. Um, a determination of a uh, record of those decisions will be issued to the homeowners, correct? Correct. Correct. All right. Thank you. Moving along. Item number seven is a request for a variance of village code 535-19E sub 4C at residential property 2318 East Lake Bluff Boulevard. Um, we'll begin on this matter with returning to our village attorney to provide us with a summary of the standard of review for a request for a variance. So this one, uh, there's a, a couple more factors to take into consideration with a variance than with our last one. Essentially, what the board must do uh, is make two separate findings. Number one, that exceptional circumstances exist. And number two, that there's an absence of detriment. Now, those are a little bit terms of art. So exceptional circumstances, three different things need to happen. Number one, there needs to be an exceptional, extraordinary, or unusual circumstance or condition that applies to the property in question. Is there something unique? Uh, number two, that condition does cannot generally apply to other properties in that district. So if you think about it, it might mm -hmm. be a unique characteristic of a property, but when you look at the district that it's in, all those properties have that characteristic. It's no longer unique. Uh, and number three, the variance can't be so general or of a recurrent nature that would suggest that the code needed to be changed to apply to everyone in the same way. So that's an exceptional circumstance. Absence of detriment, there's two requirements. The variance uh, cannot create substantial detriment to an adjacent property. So to a, another property owner, there can't be a detriment there. And number two, uh, there can't be a material impairment or it can't be contrary to the purpose and spirit of the code or of public interest. That's a, a general catch-all. Uh, the board is allowed to grant a variance if, number one, it's not contrary to public interest. Number two, a literal enforcement of the code as written would result in practical difficulty or an unnecessary hardship. And number three, the spirit and purpose of the chapter and of the village code is observed and the public safety, welfare, and justice is served by the variant. So those code sections, just for your reference, are 535-55 and 535-58. Great. Uh, questions for the village attorney as to the standard of review for a variance? Oh, hearing none. Uh, let's have a statement from the village first regarding property at 2318 East Lake Bluff Boulevard. Thank you. Oh. Or are you are you still on your I'm sorry. Uh, yes. So the property owners of 2318 East Lake Bluff are seeking a variance. Construct an outdoor fireplace in the street side yard setback area of 2318 East Lake Bluff. The village received the building permit application on May 13th, 2024, and the Board of Appeals application on May 3rd, 2024. A patio exists in this location currently, and the owners are seeking to replace that patio with the addition of a pergola and outdoor fireplace structure. Only the fireplace structure is proposed to sit within the street side yard setback area. If a variance 
were to be granted, the owners have also submitted a residential development application for review and approval by the design review board because that's the next step in the process. Um, so the zoning regulations here is that the street side setback uh, is 25% of the width of the lot, but not less than 10 feet, um, provided that the buildable width of the lot is not less than 20. So the existing site conditions here, um, I should say the, the minimum lot width in this district is 50 feet, uh, and it is compliant at 79.88 feet. Minimum lot area in this district is 6,000 square feet. And again, it is compliant, 7,490. And the street side setback is 19.97 feet. Uh, and what we have proposed uh, is 15 feet. Within the packet, we have the building permit application uh, and detailed plans, the denial letter that was provided to the applicant, their board of appeals application, a survey of the property, number of pictures, uh, aerials, and parcel. Questions for Inspector Blurris? Mm -mm. uh, sorry, just to, just to confirm, it's it's too too close essentially to the to this to the street, correct? Or it's within or, the setback or the area. setback? I yeah, say. yeah, right. Yes. Okay. And by a matter of about five feet. Correct. Right. Okay. Five feet. Um, does the existing patio, it appears like there there will be a new patio, um, but it appears, would the existing patio as it is be non-compliant with the setback requirements, or does that not apply to patio? No, uh, setbacks do apply to patios and other structures. So... Um, again, in this case, they're looking at adding a pergola as well. Um, that pergola is not in that setback area. Um, so patio and uh, pergola are would be compliant um, installations. It's the fireplace structure specifically in this case that is, I'm saying, out of compliance. So that's five feet of difference? Is that? Yes. Um, can you provide us perhaps with some background on what the importance is of this type of setback on the street side. Is it for aesthetics purposes? Is it for safety purposes or access? Or why, why would we need to keep that strip sure. clear? Um, so um, street side yards, generally they apply to corner lots. Uh, and so when you have um, all of the other homes um, on the street with say a minimum 25 foot, uh, yard setback. Um, the idea is that uh, that you would not have a structure on the end of the block sit much closer to say the sidewalk um, than the rest of the mm -hmm. uh, rest of the properties along a side of the street. Okay, so the kind of uniformity, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Additional questions for Inspector Burris? Hearing none. Uh, do we have a representative of the homeowners that would like to come up to the podium and make a statement? Toya, can you swear? Mm -hmm. Do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please state your name. My name is Stuart Karen. I am the homeowner homeowner of this subject property. Um, with me is my wife, Cheryl, as well as representatives from our contractor, Pro Hardscape Stands. Great. All right. So um, as the village attorney has explained what our standard is here, um, really we're looking for some information about your property um, that makes it hard for you to comply with the side setback requirement. So perhaps you can explain um, your project and why you think compliance um, can't be achieved here. Thank you. Um, certainly. Um, first, I want to start by thanking the committee for getting us on the agenda tonight. Um, this uh, proposed work is the second phase of a two-phase project that's currently underway by our contractor. The first phase has a permit already, uh, didn't require a variance at all. Um, but hearing this matter tonight will help keep the project progressing uh, and won't cost us any money to demobilize and mobilize. Um, 
I just want to start by saying that um, this location is the corner of Lake Bluff and Prospect. And uh, it's somewhat unique and it's a unique and historic area of the village. Um, I did bring a picture of the home. Uh, if, I, if I can approach and just show that. Sure. Right. Um, my wife and I purchased the property about 15 years ago, and this nearly 100-year-old home is in fantastic shape. It's been very well maintained, really solidly built, and we're very proud of it, and have, over the years, done some very careful improvements to the interior. Um, the improvements on the exterior that are in place currently were not of the same vintage, were not of the same quality construction, and are in need of renewal, and that's what we are undertaking right now. Um, and, um, we, we, um, I think we have presented with the, uh, the appeals package, the, uh, architecture, architectural drawings. And so you have that in mm -hmm. yep. information, um, the, um, to answer some questions first, uh, the existing patio, uh, was not built by us. It was built by the previous owners, um, is non-conforming. Uh, to answer your question, uh, it already extends two feet beyond that setback. Um, so the extension that we're talking about is actually just two feet more at this time uh, than what the existing patio. Um, I may have to ask the attorney, the, the uh, village council, for explanation on the on the, on the terms <laughs> that you rattled off. I was trying to take notes as you were going through those, but I'll try to address what I can, but maybe- Would you like us for ha to have her repeat I can the repeat standard? Well, the standard. Let, me, let me start. I think sure. in, the, in the first example, you were asking what's the detriment to our property or why, is, why do we um, are, are requesting this? Basically, it's because um, we don't have a backyard to build this patio in. The, uh, the, the building is situated pretty much in the Northwest corner of the property. Um, and that's why the existing patio is out on the side of the property too, the, the east side of the property that faces uh, Prospect. Um, this is unique to us. So if you look up and down the street, um, the other lots are of different size and configuration and everybody's got a backyard. Um, neighbors across the street um, and such like that. I think it may be unique to the corner lot uh, configuration because the neighbors on the to the east of us that are on a corner lot also have a patio that faces well basically it faces our property to the west and extends towards the street rather than being in the backyard which i don't think they have but other this is unique i think to our corner lot and unique to us um i forget what the third criteria was for that first section so i can just i'll, I'll just repeat what the criteria is okay. the the board needs to make two findings number one exceptional circumstances and number two absence of of detriment the board can grant a variance if number one the variance is not contrary to public interest number two a literal enforcement will result in a practical difficulty or unnecessary hardship and number three the spirit and purpose of the chapter the code is observed and the public safety welfare and justice is served and just for clarification, in terms of the, the point that we have to find on exceptional circumstances, here we're looking for extraordinary conditions or unique conditions of the property itself. Correct. Um, and not the structures or um, not the proposed plans proposed by the homeowner. I mean, what's, what's the legal impact of the proposed plan? We really should be focusing on the land itself. Right. So uh, for exceptional circumstances, you need to look at the conditions that apply to the property itself um, that don't apply generally to other properties in the same area. So what makes that property unique that requires the variance that's got? Well, I, have a, I have a question. So is the crux of the debate about the extra, the extra feet or is it about well, it would be about the variance that they're seeking, which I believe is for the 
design that requires extra feet into. Well, no, I understand that, but sometimes design could be a lack of a brain. That is not the case here. It's, this is a technical situation. That's the variance that they're seeking. I suppose if we did have a design that was um, a big eyesore, it could be um, perhaps go into uh, finding detriment. It could, uh, it could be a detriment to other property. Right. Owners, if we have other neighbors that are complaining about your big purple house or what, whatever it is. But this is not that. Right. I, I, I don't that's, believe. That's all. I okay. Um, would you, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but if you'd like to continue your statement, go ahead. No, thank you for that clarification. Um, with regards to abs absence of detriment to neighboring properties, um, what we're constructing to build is pretty much the same footprint as the existing patio does not infringe anywhere near uh, our neighbor's properties. And in talking to our neighbors, um, they, they received the notice and asked us questions. Well, what is this notice about? And we, we explained the project to them, showed them, you know, the, the plans and the images that we were uh, planning there. And they, they're, they're supportive. Uh, they have no problems with that um, at, at all to us. So I, I don't think there's any detriment to the neighbors. Um, from the actual construction. Now, the, the other, I think, really important point, and then you could see from the, the photos that I showed you, is that this, this property is pretty highly landscaped. Um, and uh, on the east side of the property, between the setback line and the sidewalk, uh, there's a fence line that has uh, fully mature plantings in it. So the screening on this property is, is very effective. Uh, if you were to stand on the sidewalk, and look east or look west towards where the patio is going to be, all you would be able to see is the very top of the house because there's a, a row of evergreens there that are about 13 feet tall. Uh, so there, there's a lot of uh, screening that's in place uh, that would prevent any detriment. You're to the talking neighbors. about these evergreens. Oh yeah, <laughs> exactly. So the so the 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 new construction would be basically hidden. Yes. And I, I would just want to assure you all that um, this is going to be a very high quality construction. We're going to use all natural materials. There'll be no exposed concrete. If that's the end of your statement, do you mind if we ask you a few questions? Yeah. Um, have you proposed or have you spoken with your contractor about alternatives to this particular plan to where you can have your fireplace structure in an alternative space that would comply with the code? Um, we've considered that. Um, unfortunately, in order to move the fireplace off to the side, we would have to remove uh, not just a little bit of ground cover landscaping, but trees, mature trees, uh, which we would just much rather prefer to keep on the property. Um, and we don't want to have the fireplace close to the house either, you know, for safety reasons. Um, the, the size is what it is because uh, we desire certain furniture out there, you know, to entertain guests and, and to seat our family basically around a dinner table in front of the fire. Okay. So we've looked at other designs, but it, they're somewhat impractical. Questions for the homeowners? Mm -hmm. And Toya, have we received any um, communication from the noticed neighbors as to their support or I have not okay. received any support. Occasionally we'll receive an email support. from someone. Or, so I was just checking to see whether we had anything. Okay. Um, would your contractor like to make a statement or are we comfortable? Okay. Good. Uh, Unless you have a question for them, technical question. Uh, if we're going to provide testimony, you will have to come to the podium and get sworn in. Um, is this question okay? Yeah, we'll still need you to come and just introduce yourself and Can you provide your name, please? Matthew Sherwood with Pro Hardscape and Lawn. Um Can you spell your last name, sorry. S H E R W O O D. What was the question? Oh, would you just like uh support from the neighbors then via email or letter? Um that's not necessarily needed at this moment. Um I just would like to check to know that whether the neighbors object, um, they have been noticed in accordance with our requirements. So assuming that we have not received anything, 
um, there's no solicitation for further feedback. Okay, that's fair. That's okay. all I had. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Uh, any further questions before we enter into deliberation? Okay. I move that um, any further statement from the homeowners at this time? No. Okay. Uh, I move to close deliberation or the hearing portion of this matter and enter into deliberations amongst the board. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Um, in terms of the criteria for meeting a variance here, I'm, uh, I understand that there is likely an absence of detriment. It looks like it's going to be a very nice pergola, very nice um, fireplace, a very nice pizza oven. Um, I do understand that there is some tree sh shielding. That's um, nice. However, I struggle with the first criteria of finding exceptional circumstances relating to this specific property. Mm -hmm. In particular, um, I understand that there is a layout to this particular property, um, but to me that seems recurrent with every corner property in the village is that your backyard is really your side yard mm -hmm. and each corner property will be subject to a specific percentage set back from the street side. Um, from the testimony provided and the materials in the agenda packet, um, I'm struggling with finding any unique circumstances relating to this particular property. I understand that the homeowners might want this particular feature. However, I think that we're limited in our ability to grant a variance um, just to accommodate a particular design for a fireplace when I don't see sufficient evidence showing that the property itself is unique to where they cannot comply with the um, setback requirements without hardship or practical difficulty. But that's uh, my thought. Yeah. Um, other thoughts from board members? I'm I'm in line with what you're thinking. I think it's a go gorgeous looking, you know, pergola patio fireplace. It looks, looks really beautiful, but I'm also struggling with feeding what we're what we're trying to do which is is um work with what what's at hand which is the legal description of this property being unique and i don't think we've identified it for this particular variance i i would question what the gentleman said is that they're already out of out of compliance because the property because what's there is out of compliance with the village, that their extension is only feet. We have some more clarification. Um, what? How does that impact what what's going on? Uh, if we want to take a statement from Inspector Burris at this time, I suppose that's all right. If we can get clarification on the yes. current nonconformance of the existing patio. Uh, so in 535-9 of the zoning code site restrictions, um, there are specific exemptions for certain structures, uh, so fences, patios, um, and a, uh, a front yard or street side yard patio may encroach into the setback area, but no closer than three feet to the property line. Um, so the existing patio itself uh, is not technically legal non-conforming. It would be conforming um, because it is in that setback area, but allowed to be um, because it is a, a grade level structure. Okay, but because this is a um, erection of a fireplace oven thing, this becomes a different type Correct. of- Yes. Okay. Further questions for Inspector Burris? Does the, just, just curious, does the, the two feet impact your design i mean in other words if you i guess my question well is, i don't want to open up back into oh, I, the I testimony understand. phase so we can consider what prior testimony all right is. so let me just so if you have you're already out of compliance but that's grandfathered in that what I, that my it's not out of compliance currently because it is strictly the patio and uh the the village code permits patios to sit within the setback area. So it is, uh, say, other um, erected structures that, I should say this, patios specifically are provided an exemption to sit in that setback area, uh, whereas other structures are not. I see. So 
this re this new construction independent of what exists at this point this is something brand new that would be correct so if the homeowners wanted to extend the patio because it's grade level they could up until three feet from the property line that is correct okay, and it would be conforming okay and uh, yes it, it, front and street side your patios are also limited to 30 percent of that yard area um, but again we're not out of compliance there either okay so the issue here really is just the structure of the pizza oven fireplace yes um and that encroachment by about five feet into that side setback area is what is at issue correct okay Other considerations? If not, we can propose a motion to vote. Does anyone have a motion? Hearing no volunteers. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> I will move. <laughs> uh, I will move um, to deny. Uh, well, how should I frame this? Um, I suppose I propose, I will propose to grant the variance and your vote should be according to whether you want to grant or deny the variance. Okay. Uh, I always wonder whether it's better to be negative or positive in the... Sure. I will say if you're proposing to grant, just make sure to bake in the two um, conditions. The two conditions. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, I move to grant... Well, I move to grant the variance of village code 535-19E4C at residential property 2318 East Lake Bluff Boulevard as meeting the criteria for granting a variance and a finding of exceptional circumstances relating to this property and an absence of detriment. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Toya, can you call a vote? And this would be a vote to grant the variance. Stephen Isaacson? Aye. Cole Hen Heinrich? Nay. Wendy Smith? Nay. Motion failed. One, two. Yes? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, the order will be issued to homeowners after this meeting. That is the end of our agenda. Uh, with no other items on the agenda, um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Seconded. All second. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Meeting adjourned at 6.43 p.m. Thank you, Brianna.